The term Xinjiang refers to the westernmost province of modern China, although historically it has been a part of what's called Central Asia. Today the majority of the people living there belong to the Muslim faith, which raises the question how did Islam find its way into an area so remote and far from the Islamic heartland. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a streaming service founded by passionate and talented filmmakers. You can find a lot of documentaries and shows in various genres, from history to science and even culture. They're adding new shows all the time, which you can enjoy on all sorts of devices. Also, best of all, there are no ads and an increasing percentage of shows is now available in 4K with no additional cost. They were kind enough to offer Al Muqaddimah viewers an extended free month-long trial. You can use the link in the description to take advantage of that. Since you're watching a history channel, you might also like many historical documentaries that they have. I would recommend the documentary Farah Diba Pahlvi, The Last Empress. It tells the incredible story of the last empress of Iran as she went from a university student to the Shabano or Queen Consort of Iran until she was exiled after the Islamic Revolution of Iran. It also documents what she has been up to ever since and provides a fascinating look into the lives of defunct royals of the Muslim world. Secondly, since we're talking about Xinjiang, it would help to understand what the region means to China in terms of economic potential. So I'd recommend their documentary, How China Got Rich, which tells the story of how the rather backwards communist country became the lifeblood of modern capitalism. Again, you can get a free month-long trial to enjoy these documentaries. Now, let's discuss the term Central Asia and what it means. Today, the countries of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan are collectively referred to as Central Asia, but historically, the borders have been more blurrier and expansive than that. The region has mainly been defined by two things. First of all, Xinjiang and the rest of Central Asia are on the crossroads of the ancient Silk Road. All the overland trade that went on between China, India, Middle East and Europe flowed through this region. Secondly, it's been defined by the fact that outer powers have usually been unable to control the region. Now, before I start the history of Xinjiang, I want to note that the region is going through some serious turmoil right now. And so, there are various nationalist movements there that have their own versions of events, not to mention the Chinese government and its propaganda machine. So, I won't really be going into those ethnic, linguistic and cultural details at the moment. That's a story for another time. Xinjiang itself is a recent name. Historically, the region has been called Chinese Turkestan or Eastern Turkestan. This is in reference to the Turkic-speaking population that lived here compared to the Persian-speaking population in the oases to the west and the south. All these names are controversial with one group or the other, but for the purpose of this video, I'm going to stick with Xinjiang. The region of Xinjiang itself is divided into three basins, the Tarim to the south, the Turfan or Turpan to the southeast, and Jungar to the north. Xinjiang being a collection of these bases was difficult to control for almost all outer powers and various empires and kingdoms from the Caspian in the west to the Pacific in the east tried to exercise control over it. For our purpose, we'll start with the Tang Dynasty which conquered Xinjiang around 630 or so. Around the same time, Prophet Muhammad passed away and the Muslims started conquering Byzantine and Sasanian territories. Over the next century, the borders of the Tang and the Umayyad Caliphate came closer and closer together as both expanded into Central Asia. In 751, the newly established Abbasid Caliphate met the Tang Dynasty at the Battle of Talas River. The Muslims defeated the Chinese Empire and halted its expansion for the West. While the battle itself is usually not considered very important, it did result in one interesting thing. Chinese prisoners were taken in battle and held in Samarkand. They taught the Muslims how to make paper and hence played a significant but indirect role in the Golden Age of Islam. Although the Tang had not been able to control the region before the clash with the Muslims either. On top of everything, a series of rebellions, the most famous of which is An Lushan's rebellion from 755 to 763, ensured that the Tang would never influence Central Asia again. In fact, a Chinese-based state would not be able to directly rule Xinjiang for almost another thousand years. Xinjiang at the time was a mix of various religions. Buddhism was sort of the primary religion, tied with Zoroastrianism and Manichaeism, 
there were Christians and Jewish minorities here and there as well. Even though the road to Central Asia was open after the Battle of Talos River, Muslim control was more or less limited to Merv. While Islam was expanding further, it was under local control and not the control of the Caliph back in Baghdad. Various powers rose up and fell in the region until around 850, when the Karakhanids rose up. The Karakhanids founded their empire and then split into two branches, the senior one being called Arsalan Khans, meaning the Lion Khans, and the junior one being called Bukhra Khans, meaning the Bull Khans. The Bukhra Khans are important in that they introduced Islam to Xinjiang. One of their princes, named Satuk, converted to Islam in around 934 or so. There are various stories of his conversion, but the generally reasonable one is that he was inspecting caravan goods one day when he saw some Muslim merchants stopping all business to pray at the call to prayer. The sight proved powerful for the young prince as he started learning the Quran and converted soon after. Then he got a fatwa against his ruling Bughra Khan uncle and overthrew him. He also defeated the senior Arsalan Khans and started spreading Islam through force if needed among his subjects. It's said that 200,000 tenths of Turks converted to Islam overnight, although the number is quite obviously exaggerated. Satuk is revered in some parts of Xinjiang almost as a saint today. Over the next century, the Karakhanids destroyed the Samanid dynasty and took over the firmly Muslim Transoxiana as well as most of Xinjiang. They have the distinction of being the first of many Turkic ruling dynasties in the Islamic world. The famous scholar Mahmoud Kashgari was also a member of the dynasty, a story for another time. The Karakhanids themselves struggled against other Central Asian Muslim dynasties, namely the Saljuks and the Ghaznavids. Although it was the Buddhist Mongolic Karakhite dynasty who defeated them and reduced them to tributaries around 1140 or so. While early on they were nice to the Muslims and people of other religions, around 1210 or so the dynasty had become weak and unstable until a man named Kuchluk or something like that took over the Karakhite state and started persecuting the minorities. However, his reign would be cut short by a certain somebody who lived nearby. You might know him, his name was Genghis Khan. The Mongol army invaded in 1216 and put an end to the Karakhite. Due to the intolerance they had faced before, the Muslims of Xinjiang actually greeted Genghis Khan as their liberator. They were left mostly untouched and in fact, the Uyghurs would have a great relationship with the following Mongol Khans and would rise to hold many important positions. After Genghis Khan died in 1227, the empire was divided up and Xinjiang was given to the Chagdai Khanate. The Mongols continued to rule the region, sometimes stopping for a coffee or a civil war on the road until 1360. Longtime fans of the channel will remember that a certain 24 year old aspiring conqueror who was lame in one leg was starting to build power around this time. By this time, the Chagatai dynasty had largely converted to Islam, so Xinjiang was once again under the control of Muslims. However, the Khanate was divided into two the Western Transoxiana and the Eastern Mughalistan. Xinjiang was a part of the latter. The western part quickly collapsed as Timur the Lame or Tamerlane conquered it, although he let the Khan of Mughalistan stay on as a puppet. One of those puppets, Khizr Khwaja, expanded his control over Xinjiang and further spread Islam. Muslims, who were a majority in only a few cities and a minority as a whole, were now the majority of the population in Xinjiang. We know this because by 1450, mosques were common enough in the region to be mentioned by travelers in their accounts. But at the same time, there were still Buddhist temples all over the place. So while the Muslims were a majority, it wasn't by much. Now, how did Islam actually spread in the region? While it's true that the sword was used, that wasn't the case for a large majority of the people who converted. In fact, a more subtle approach by the Sufis is probably what's responsible for the conversion. First of all, the Islam of the Sufis was not very disruptive. Famous Sufis have these stories of them performing healing and miracles, not unlike the shamans that the Central Asian population had believed in before. As James Milward writes, In demonstrating healing powers, designing battles by magical tricks or surviving trials by fire, Sufis acted like the shamans associated with Turco-Mongol rulers across Eurasia. In fact, in some ways, the form of popular Islam that took root in the Xinjiang region following centuries of Sufi missionary work was overlaid upon without displacing pre-existing beliefs and cults. This is evident at many smaller shrines in Xinjiang. 
especially those not dedicated to well-known historical figures but to nameless khajas or masters. One such shrine is at Komartagh on the hill overlooking the floodplains of the Karatash and Yarunkash rivers south of Khotan. This striking site was once sacred to Buddhists. Now it commemorates a hunter who, after a snake spirit comes to his aid, promised to build a place of worship on this spot. The tomb on the site, supposedly of the hunter, his parents and the snake, resembles similar chirons in Mongolia and Tibet, festooned with sticks, flags, sheep's horn and yak tails, all reminiscent of shamanic practice. Clearly an older tradition at Kumartagh has been recast as Islamic as it has at similar shrines throughout the region. One of the biggest names in the Sufis of Central Asia is Bahauddin Naqshband of Bukhara. He established the Naqshbandiya order of Sufis. Many of his students and followers quickly became important figures in royal courts all over Central Asia. Now, even though I'm a Muslim, I usually don't talk about theology because I think that since I'm a Sunni Muslim, I might be a little biased against other beliefs in Islam. So I asked for help from one of my most favorite YouTube historians, Philip Holm from Let's Talk Religion. So the Naqshbandiya is a Sufi order or tariqa in Arabic, which means path. Sufism generally consists of a large number of these different orders or paths, and the Naqshbandiya is one of the largest and most widespread in history. It originated in Central Asia in modern Uzbekistan with the Sufi preacher and Saint Baha'uddin Muhammad al-Naqshband. It quickly spread from its native region and became prominent in a number of places, especially on the Indian subcontinent, so modern India and Pakistan, as well as in parts of Central and Eastern Asia. Many of the teachings and practices of the Naqshbandi order are shared with other Sufi orders. Central practices like the dhikr, in which God's names are invoked for long periods of time, as well as other forms of meditation, and a strong reliance on Islamic law and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. But the Naqshbandiya is distinguished in a few ways. For example, whereas most other Sufi orders will perform their dhikr vocally, that is, they will chant the names of God or different phrases uh, vocally or, or loudly in a, in a group, the Naqshbandi order is famous for their silent dhikr, which means that their dhikr is entirely internal. They don't move the tongue or speak or chant as they do it, but only focus on remembering God in the heart and the mind. They have also generally rejected any form of sama, audition, or in other words, music as a form of spiritual practice, which is very common in other orders. For these reasons, among many others, the Naqshbandi has often been seen as one of the more orthodox Sufi orders. In places like Mughal India, for example, they often represented a more strict and conservative form of Sufism, one that often criticized other orders as not following the Sharia or the Sunnah of the Prophet properly. A second reason why the Naqshbandis have often been considered more orthodox or sober in their practice is one of their characteristic teachings, which is often referred to as solitude in the crowd. And this means that they have generally rejected any form of extreme renunciation or asceticism, instead preferring to be internally detached from the world while still actively participating in society and in things like politics. Which, of course, brings us back to the main subject of the video. Back to you. Thank you, Philip. Philip has made a video on the Naqshbandiya order and their beliefs over on his channel. You should definitely watch that one after you finish this one. I cannot recommend that channel enough. Check it out and let him know that al Muqaddima and hopefully al Muqaddima's audience love his videos. Now, back to Xinjiang. After the collapse of the Timurids, a new power showed up, the Uzbeks. They broke apart whatever was left of the Timurids and the Chagatai, and Xinjiang collapsed into various city-states. In fact, Tarim Basin at this point is referred to as Altishahar or Six Cities. The Uzbeks would push a Timurid prince named Babur into India who would bring the Naqshbandiya order there with him and fuel another similar process of Islamization. Around the same time, new tribal confederations started to appear to fill the vacuum of power and some familiar names started to come forth like the aforementioned Uzbeks, the Kazakhs and the Kyrgyz. Xinjiang was almost completely Islamized by the 17th century. Many of these local Muslim rulers were influenced by Sufi masters or Khajas. While all of them were successors to various students of Bahauddin Naqshband, they all formed their own branches of the Naqshbandiya order and competed for influence. One not untypical story goes that around the 1670s, there were two powerful branches there. The most powerful of the two was the Afakia under Khwaja Afak, while the Ishakia branch was weak but not insignificant. 
When the patron Mughal Khan of the Afakia left for pilgrimage to Mecca, his son overthrew him with the help of the Ishaqiyas and drove Khaja Afak out. Khaja Afak then went to the Dalai Lama in Tibet. The Dalai Lama himself was in a similar spiritual power behind the throne kind of situation. The Dalai Lama helped Khaja Afak by uniting the Buddhists and having them attack the Tarim Basin and installing Afak as the secular ruler in exchange for tribute, of course. After Afak's death, his widow led the rivalry against the Ishaqiyas and earned the nickname of Jalad Khanum or the Butcher Queen. Taking advantage of the instability, both the newly emerging Zungar Khanate to the north and the Qing dynasty to the east attempted to expand into Xinjiang, which resulted in a series of wars between the two contenders. Xinjiang would finally fall to the Qing dynasty in 1759, while there would be unrest, rebellions and even a short-lived independent Muslim state in the coming century, Xinjiang now belonged to China. In 1884, it would become an official province of the Qing Empire and given the name of Xinjiang, meaning New Frontier. See you next time. This video is the first in my series on how Islam reached various parts of the world. So if you want to follow that, please subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to like, share and comment to let me know your thoughts on this video and the new series. Also, you can pledge a dollar or more on Patreon and you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and OnlyFans. Thank you for watching.